Thanks for joining us for CBN Newswatch. I'm Mark Martin. Today, Israel marking 100 days since the deadly Hamas terrorist attacks on October 7th. We'll look at what Israel is doing to free the hostages amid fears of a widening war. As the 100-day anniversary approached, Israelis gathered by the thousands to pray for their country at the Western Wall. We're going to bring you a first-hand report. After months of campaigning, voters in Iowa finally going to their caucuses today in the midst of snow and brutally cold weather that's hit much of the U.S. And ministering in marriage, how one couple is helping Christian marriages succeed. Those stories and more today on this Newswatch. This is CBN Newswatch. We begin in the Middle East where Israel marked 100 days on Sunday since the Hamas massacre on October 7th and the kidnapping of 240 Israelis and other nationals. As Chris Mitchell reports from Jerusalem, the condition of the more than 130 hostages remains the heart cry of their families. Relatives and friends of hostages held by Hamas marked the 100 days in a 24-hour rally in Tel Aviv, including 100 seconds of silence. Israel's President Isaac Herzog issued a call to the world. Stand with life and liberty against barbarism and hate. Stand with freedom and democracy. Stand with our hostages and help bring them back home. There is no later. The time to act is now. Released hostage Raz Benami, whose husband Ohad is still a captive, described her ordeal. Being kidnapped is not being able to sleep, knowing that terrorists are aiming a gun at your head. To be kidnapped is to feel powerless, to lose control of your life. Being kidnapped is not knowing if you will live in the next minute. It's been a difficult time for the entire family the past three months, and I can't believe it's been three months. On CBN's Faith Nation, Moshe Levy said it's been weeks since his family has heard news of his brother-in-law, Omri. We worried sick because we hear testimonies of those released hostages, and, and many of them, not all, but many say and share that they were held in, in difficult conditions, the private food and water, sanitary, proper sanitary conditions. Some were abused, tortured, sexually violated. So when you wake up every day, you think about um, what he's facing there. In Washington, D.C., pro-Palestinian protesters called for an end of Israel's military action in Gaza. Security officials relocated White House staff members after some protesters damaged the exterior fence. On the military front, Hamas marked the 100-day anniversary of the October 7th attacks with a salvo of rockets and a banner, January 14th, 100 days of battle, Ashdod under fire, and we have more. In the Red Sea, the Houthis launched a missile at a U.S. warship. The first attack since the U.S. and U.K. launched two airstrikes against the Iranian-backed group. This satellite image shows substantial damage at this airfield. And the Navy says it's still searching for two missing SEALs who fell into the sea during a nighttime boarding off the coast of Aden last Thursday in a mission to stop more arms shipments to Yemen. And Chris is with us now from Jerusalem. Chris, the Houthis have retaliated as promised with that missile attack. Is there concern in Israel that the U.S. and U.K. missile strikes last week could lead to a widening war? Yeah, definitely, Mark. Uh, the question is, what will happen if the Houthis just continue their attacks? Will that mean the U.K. and the U.S. will have to continue their own attacks? What happens if Iran gets directly involved? You know, this is a very significant uh, issue down there because 15% of global shipping goes off the coast of Yemen through the Red Sea. Uh, the U.S. may designate the Houthis as a terror group. Uh, by the way, the Biden administration, when they got into office, they lifted that designation. Uh, there was a move criticized by many at the time. Uh, in the first uh, strike, uh, Mark, the U.K. and the U.S. hit 28 locations. They followed that up Saturday with that uh, attack against the Houthi radar, radar site. Uh, the other question is, uh, could the ceasefire between the Houthis and Saudi Arabia that had in, been involved in a war for many years, will that break down? Uh, the supreme leader of the Houthis has pledged a bigger response, so we'll see what happens. But definitely what happens with Yemen and the Red Sea could lead to a wider war. 
What is the Israeli government's current thinking on getting the remaining hostages released? Well, there's two, uh, two major ideas. Some believe, and this would include uh, Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu and Yoav Gallant, the defense minister, they believe military uh, action against Hamas is the best way to, uh, to, to get the hostages relieved. On the other hand, it's been reported that the War Cabinet observer and the former IDF chief of staff, his name is Gadi Ashkenaut, he lost a son and a nephew in the fighting. He says he wants brave decisions to release the hostages. Benny Gantz is part of that, uh, that coalition or, or, or opinion, and uh, that may include a halt in the fighting. And he feels, uh, Gadi Ashkenaut, uh, time is running out. Now, everybody agrees on the priority of releasing the hostages. Uh, it's just a question of how that is done. And, uh, Mark, this is just one more example of sometimes the unspeakable dilemmas that Israel finds itself in. Yes, Chris Netanyahu is promising that no one will stop Israel's war against Hamas after the charges of genocide at the world court. What is the Biden administration saying to Israel about the war? Well, they're saying they're urging a low-scale war right now. They want to tone down the military campaign. Uh, yesterday on one of the Sunday talk shows, the NSC uh, uh, spokesman John Kirby said the time is running out. Uh, or time is coming for a transition to a low-intensity phase. Now, why would he say something like that? Some believe the administration is getting political pressure from the progressive wing of the Democrat Party, uh, especially going into a presidential campaign where political support for the administration's waning in some of the key battle states like, uh, like Michigan. So that's what they're advising, while Netanyahu is saying they have to do everything necessary to make sure they eliminate Hamas. How much progress has Israel made against Hamas in the war so far? Well, they released, the IDF released information at the 100-day mark, and they say that they've killed about 9,000 Hamas terrorists, dozens of Hamas commanders. Uh, also, Hamas, on the other side, has launched nearly 11,000 rockets into Israel. Uh, about 9,000 have actually got into Israel, most of them shot down by the Iron Dome uh, anti-missile system. Up north, the IDF has killed about 170 Hezbollah members, including a top commander. Uh, so that's just some of the statistics, uh, you know, since October 7th and now marking 100 days after the war. You know, we said in our report that uh, Hamas fired a salvo of rockets yesterday, so they still have some capability and capacity to continue to wage war. Is Israel still finding Hamas weapons in civilian locations? Mark, incredibly, they do. Uh, just the other day, the IDF found weapons, explosives, and ammunition in a child's bedroom. You know, our war correspondent Chuck Colton said, really, what Gaza has been is civilians living in a military base. And almost everywhere the IDF is gone, they have found weapons, whether it's mosques, schools, a kid's bedroom, uh, in civilian areas. Uh, they found tunnels all the way through under hospitals. Uh, so it's just an, uh, incredible, and it just goes to say what uh, Yoav Gallant, the defense minister, said, that Gaza was the largest terror base in the world, and that's why it's taken so long so far, 100 days, for the IDF continue to eradicate and eliminate Hamas. Okay, our CBN News Middle East Bureau Chief Chris Mitchell from Jerusalem. Thanks, as always, Chris, and continue to stay safe. As Israel approached 100 days of war and captivity for the more than 100 hostages, Israeli religious leaders called for a prayer gathering at the Western Wall to cry out to God, and Israelis responded. Here again is Chris Mitchell with that story. Thousands of Jews came here to the Western Wall, including the families of those kidnapped, the injured soldiers. They came to cry out, plead, and invoke heavenly mercy upon all of Israel. We are Jews who believe that by the power of prayer, we can change everything, to do much better, to operate much better. We are people who seek only good, and therefore we stood here, tens of thousands of people, and we ask God that He'll heal the wounded, that He'll return the hostages, that He'll protect the soldiers, that He'll do good in the world, that He'll bring peace to the world. Rabbi Shmuel Rabinovich, chief rabbis of Israel and other rabbis, led the prayers at one of the holiest sites in Judaism. 
It was the biggest gathering at the Western Wall in Jerusalem since the October 7th war began. He told CBN News, seeing all the different parts of Israeli society, religious and secular, come together as one, really touched him. We are a generation that needs to unite. The 7th of October changed things. Until then, we had a year with lots of arguments. This year, since the 7th of October, we see differently. We see the people of Israel. It turns out that on the inside, they are together. On the inside, they love one another. During the prayer, shofars and trumpets were sounded. Special prayers were prayed for the well-being of IDF soldiers, the recovery of the wounded, and the return of the captives. Representatives of the captives' families took part in reciting psalms. I'm feeling strong now. With all of the people are here, coming to be with us, the hostages' families. Adi's brother, Shlomi Ziv, was kidnapped while working at the Nova Festival. Some hundreds of Israelis were murdered there and dozens of others taken hostage. What we have uh, without faith, hope and uh, unity and praying, praying for God, praying everyone in his way, for the people to come back home, for the health of the injured. Though it's not easy, she says the people of Israel live. We know that the government will bring our uh, brothers and sisters, all the other students, uh, home. And we are supporting the, the ministry and the IDF and all the uh, forces to bring our, uh, our families together again. And the heart will be whole again. Israeli-American Eli Lipschitz says while Israel is fighting back on a physical level, there's more to be done. There's also a feeling that we need to connect on a spiritual level, to connect everybody together, to pray, to shout out, to scream at what's going on, and to, to pray to God to, to help us to bring back the hostages and make sure that everybody that's in harm's way will be safe. Lipschitz says there's an awakening as to what is going on and what Israel is fighting for. Obviously, the, the horrific terrorist attack was an attack against Jews. It's against Jews everywhere. We're fighting a fight that uh, the, world, the world's going to be fighting. If it's not going to be fought in Israel, it's going to be fought everywhere else. And uh, it's important that people gather around both praying to God and supporting Israel physically and spiritually because this is the right war and this is a just war and something that we don't have a choice but to win. We have no place else to go. We need to stand with Israel and God's chosen people. Well, coming up here at home, voters in Iowa are going to their famous caucuses today to cast their ballots for a Republican presidential nominee. The vote coming as a major snowstorm hits throughout the Midwest and other parts of the country. We're going to have those stories when we come back. Download the CBN News app, one place for all of your news. Breaking news alerts. Watch CBN News Channel Live. CBN News, because truth matters. Get the CBN News app today. Welcome back. After months of campaigning and debates, voters in Iowa will finally have their say. Republican candidates are urging their supporters to brave freezing cold and windy weather to cast their votes. With former President Donald Trump holding a 28-point lead over his closest rival, the vote is cast as a battle for second place. And former U.N. Ambassador Nikki Haley is moving up, overtaking Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. After Iowa, the candidates will turn to the big New Hampshire primary a week from Tuesday. The Iowa vote comes as a dangerous Arctic blast is still sweeping across the U.S. today, and it will linger through at least the middle of the week. The National Weather Service said wind chills are expected to push temperatures to 30 degrees below zero from the northern Rockies to northern Kansas and into Iowa. Arctic storms left at least four dead and knocked out electricity to tens of thousands in the northwest. They brought snow to the south and walloped the northeast with blizzard conditions. Still ahead, we're going to meet a pair of high school sweethearts who married other people, divorced, then reconnected and married each other. We're going to see how they're helping couples in their church to build a better marriage. It's right after this. Christian marriages are failing at nearly the same rate as other marriages. 
Still very few churches are equipped to help couples deal with the challenges of marriage. The good news, one ministry is helping to reverse this trend. Wendy Griffith reports. Her heart is just the purest, most kind person I've ever met in my life. And, and boy, did I need that. And, and God uh, blessed me with her and, and put her in front of me at just the right time in my life. And Tammy, what do you love about Mike? Everything. He's, he's amazing. He is my knight in shining armor. Um, I love the way he cherishes me and the way he thinks of me. I'm a priority. It sounds like Tammy and Mike McIver of Fort Worth, Texas, have a nearly perfect marriage, an achievement that's taken hard work to maintain. Their love story actually began 30 years ago as high school sweethearts. But after graduation, they went their separate ways, married other people, and then got divorced. Facebook helped them find each other again, a connection that led to marriage. And after four years together, they don't plan to make the same mistakes they made in their first go rounds. Our previous marriages were, were not Christ-centered and, and caused so many issues, conflicts, lack of communication, and ultimately apathy. We knew that we wanted a Christ-centered marriage, and the question was, how, how do you do that? And that is precisely what the group Communio is helping churches offer their married or soon-to-be-married members, a way to answer that question and ultimately save marriages. 72% of churches lack a substantive marriage ministry. And if you just looked at uh, what churches allocate, right, 85% of all uh, churches in the United States report spending $0 annually on marriage and relationship ministry. Zero. Zero. Yeah. The number of people getting married each year has dropped 61% since the year 1970. 31% since the year 2000. The number of people getting divorced is still too high. And yet the church has not gotten strategically engaged in uh, renewing the marriage in the family. We're still behaving ministerially like uh, it's the 1950s. Communio President J.P. DeGance's mission to save marriages includes equipping churches with resources and tools they need to foster and nurture healthy relationships. So when we work with churches, we want to be data informed. We want to come alongside the church, analyze what's going on in the congregation and the community in order to design a ministry that's customized for the church. Thanks in part to the ministry's influence, Mike and Tammy sought premarital counseling as a safeguard, but didn't stop there. After taking their vows, they signed up for a marriage class at their church called Undivided, where they discovered the true meaning of having Jesus at the center of their relationship. A Christ-centered marriage is a marriage where you love your spouse the way that Jesus loved us. Jesus loved the church. Jesus loved Israel, his bride, unconditionally through sacrifice, through love and honor and cherish. That's how we're called to love our spouse, where I put her first, she puts me first. Today, Mike and Tammy co-lead a marriage boost class each Wednesday night at their Fort Worth church, where they focus on everything from conflict resolution to learning each other's love languages to hosting date nights with free childcare. And it's really cool to see what the class does for people. We have had people come in that, that were living separately, that were on the verge of divorce, that hadn't talked to each other in a deep manner for a year. And slowly but surely, they, they keep coming back. Then they're holding hands, and then they're talking, and now they're going on dates, and now they're moving back in together. The McIvers say without Communio, many people wouldn't know about their church's programs. The amount of work that they've done within our church and our marriage ministry as far as helping us to, to market the program and talk to the right people and gather the right, right data on you know, where we can best focus our efforts for marriage ministry. And you see, when you go to those date nights, you can see that there are so many people there that are not in our church. They it's, just hear about it. It's amazing. Communio helps with that. They really bring extra new people in, into our church. Would you go as far, Michelle, as to say it saved your marriage? I would. Former junior high sweethearts Michelle Berger and Lloyd Swords of Billings, Montana, also went on to marry other people and get divorced. When they found each other again and married six years ago, Unresolved issues nearly tore them apart. Lloyd, I see, I see some tears. What are you thinking about right now? Kind of just reliving some of it, and uh, it it kind of always affects me. Um, but uh, it's 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 usually in a good way. Thanks to Communio's influence and a marriage masterclass that focused on forgiveness, the couple is back on track. You've got to try everything you can. You know, God is not a fan of divorce 
And I think in our society today, it's too easy. It's too easy to just say, I'm done, I'm leaving. And take the time, invest in this course, go through it because it is life-changing in marriage. So I quickly figured out that if your marriage is in a dumpster fire, it's really hard to disciple your children. Parent discipleship pastor Sarah Siegler of Denver, Colorado, has been married for 28 years and has four children, including three who were adopted. She says it's important to invest in your marriage at every stage. Your marriage is your number one relationship outside of God, and you've got to invest in it. You've got to keep it healthy. You've got to keep it strong so that you can support uh, your children and pass on the faith. DeGantz agrees and believes now more than ever, Christians need to pursue healthy marriages, not just for themselves, but for future generations. And it does look like God has made the family and marriage in particular an essential ingredient for uh, advancing the Christian faith. And, and that's, uh, that's clear uh, through scripture, and it's important for churches not to walk away from that. Wendy Griffith, CBN News, Old Town Alexandria, Virginia. Coming up, a spiritual outpouring began in the U.S. last year, and early in 2024, we're seeing evidence that it's still underway. We're going to have that story for you when we come back. Stay with us. The spiritual outpouring that began in 2023 is continuing into the new year. On the social media site X, formerly known as Twitter, evangelist Matt Brown of Think Eternity noted that crowds at several New Year's events added up to more than 100,000, including 55,000 at the annual Passion Conference in Atlanta. Brown said that doesn't include the millions of people who worshiped at local churches to pray in the new year, as well as many who are fasting and praying during the first weeks of 2024. And that's going to do it for this edition of CBN Newswatch. Remember, you can find more of our news programs on the CBN News channel anytime or online with CBNNews.com. Also, tell us what you think about the stories you've seen by emailing newswatch at CBN.com. Or you can talk to us on Facebook, Twitter, or X, and Instagram. Hope you'll join us next time. Have a great day.